Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Joy J. Moore. This podcast is for the 11th Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on August 21st, 2022. The complimentary Old Testament reading, Isaiah 58, 9b through 14, or the semi-continuous Old Testament reading is Jeremiah 1, verses 4 through 10. The Psalm is 103, verses 1 through 8. The epistle reading is not really an epistle, but it's Hebrews 12, 18 through 29. We'll call it the second reading. And the gospel is Luke 13, 10 through 17. The healing of a woman with a bad back. Yeah. Which well, uh, I can relate to, but um, <laughs> not quite as severe as her condition. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to start us out by giving a title for your sermon All for right. your preachers out there. And I'm going to quote quite a bit from Raquel Lutzum, who preached a brilliant sermon on this text at one of our events at Luther Seminary, the Craft of Preaching event. And I think it's uh, even on our YouTube channel if if the preachers want to watch it, but it's a, a, a brilliant sermon. This particular title is not from the sermon, but it alludes to the themes that uh, th that uh, Dr. Lepsum, Lepsum brings out. And here's it's a the long title. Run up. I know. <laughs> I know. Are you with me? Following me? Yeah. Here we go. I'm with you. Talk, we're, we're, we're bated breath. <laughs> All right. Here's the title. Well, then when? Ooh. You like it? I like it. <laughs> right? You, and the well, not today. Well, not today, then when? Then when? And boy, oh boy, is that uh, a, a theme that has wider consequences right now in our world. Uh, and so Raquel, Dr. Letsum does this, okay, so where she does this whole refrain uh, on not today, right? Mm -hmm. Not today is not an option. Yeah. Uh, uh, not today. Uh, today is the day of no more delays, no more deliberations. And, uh, and what, what will be the day when we will act uh, for on, on someone's behalf and that uh, there's no coming back tomorrow, <laughs> you know, well, if not, if not now, then when, and that the timing of another person's freedom might not be very inconvenient for us. And that the determ determination of someone's freedom um, is, is, is not about our inconvenience. It's just a brilliant sermon, but I really, I, 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 I quote it at length because that whole theme of, well, then when. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, and, and it goes back to the urgency that we were talking about last week, right, with these texts. But, uh, it, but how is it that we, uh, that we postpone <laughs> acts, we postpone freedom, we postpone deliverance, we postpone justice, we postpone righteousness and say to people, come back tomorrow. Mm -hmm. How has the church yeah. done that? How is, have we done that personally? And that's what this text is about. Yeah. Wow. And we do it for reasons that seem like really good reasons. Mm -hmm. Or that seem like holy reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, that's nothing about Sabbath law or anything like that. But it's just the mm -hmm. way in which we um, find ways for our own convenience or our own Mm -hmm. kind of religious enjoyment to mm -hmm. um to extend the suffering of others so we consider that to be an acceptable byproduct or acceptable collateral damage mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i um it, it makes me think um when we talk about the question of the law uh it, it reminds me that every law is not just just because it's legal doesn't mean that it's right and um, in verse 17, um, it says that all his opponents were put to shame. 
And the crowd was rejoicing at the wonderful things that Jesus was doing. It's another one of those texts that we find throughout scripture where when Jesus does something that is liberating for another, or when God does something that's liberating for another, when Jesus heals, when Jesus touches, when Jesus um, feeds, when Jesus calls, when Jesus um, is present, when Jesus acknowledges, when Jesus invites himself to your table, Someone is put to shame because of that act of generosity that Jesus has e extended. And um, so we might have a law that we are willing to follow, but the right thing to do might be gracious to someone else. And in that grace, we will cause the shame of someone who thinks they're doing the legal thing. We have to be very careful about that. Mm -hmm. And and that makes me think too, in highlighting that verse, Joy, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things he was doing is ambiguous enough to invite us into what are they rejoicing about? And of course, this is a theme in Luke of praising is a, is a um, called for response to God's uh, presence with going back all the way to, you know, to uh, Mary, Elizabeth and Mary and the shepherds. And, and then the, and then the gospel of course will end with, they were continually in the temple praising God. So, but here it's this sense of, this is, this is also what Raquel talks about, like that, that the entire crowd was rejoicing because they realized that today there weren't going to be any more delays, that today there weren't going to be any more deliberations, you know, that this was the day. And I, uh, and so uh, that, that sense of rejoicing that, uh, that, it, you know, the, the, mm, the presence and possibility of the kingdom is not going to be put off. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and another thing we should point out too, I mean, you mentioned this last week, Matt, but that we skip over the parable of the pig fig tree here. And that's, that could be another lens again, through which to read this passage is, is that, you know, what, what fruit are you bearing of, of your fruit, uh, of your, of your faith, right? What is the, what is the fruit that you're bearing? Uh, and so that lends it. And what time? Mm -hmm. time and season mm -hmm. yeah should you be bearing fruit or what okay. yeah yeah I, I think too uh i like the idea of like what are people rejoicing about is it because wow this guy's really powerful or mm. is it because there's something about today that's now been been changed so if mm. if i were choosing a title you had a great title thank you here's the alternate title Best Sabbath ever. <laughs> oh, is, I like that. Um, I like that. <laughs> which is because there's something about Sabbath observance that's that's hopeful, that's that's proleptic, that looks forward to something. Mm -hmm. um, the Sabbath is never truly the Sabbath when anybody on the earth has to work that day. I, I mean, heard Jews talk about there's something privileged about being able to take a day off right but if somebody has to work seven days a week so you can have a day off something's wrong mm -hmm. so the fact that these people experience somebody being brought to liberation on a sabbath day in their midst it's like this is what the day has been proclaiming and hoping for and now we're seeing it start to become fulfilled yeah. in our midst which would be yeah. great uh, you could also people are free to change the uh, the old testament reading you could do deuteronomy 5 just the sabbath commandment there and Mm. and show people like look at this the sabbath is based on the exodus it's based on a god who hates enslavement mm -hmm. a god who knows how bad that is for not just the dignity of individual persons but for human flourishing generally and all of and some people will be surprised because they'll say i thought it was the seventh day god rested and you can explain it's exodus 20 you know but just to or know your I old testament people you know, isaiah 58 well we can and go there <laughs> or we can go to Isaiah 58, and um, it's it's uh, uh, a, a nice uh, turn into that. If you thought about 
uh, from where we were last week. And depending on where you preached last week, if you did some finger pointing, which we cautioned against taking, if you spoke of evil, then um, the beginning of this basically says that's the yoke that you need to remove. And what becomes what we are to do, if it begins in that negative, what is it that we are to do? Offer what would be nourishment, offer what would be satisfying, offer what would be meeting the needs, offer what would be liberating, offer what would be light in the darkness, which is what we've just talked about. Well, if not today, when? Mm -hmm. Or I love your title, Matt, best Sabbath ever. And what will it look like? It would look like um, no more hunger, no more thirst, no more darkness. Uh, liberation. It, it, it's the very flip side of this text. And we can stay in Isaiah to get it because this is the end of Isaiah where the good news is proclaimed more than uh, the critique. Yeah. And then, and then again, if you go that direction with that title, Best Sabbath Ever, uh, that you, <laughs> that, uh, that you get that connection between you know, joy, rejoicing, delight, and the Sabbath. If you call the Sabbath a delight, right? And the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own way, serving your own interests or pursuing your own affairs, uh, uh, but the way in which the Sabbath becomes this recognition of what we've already talked about of, of a, a day of liberation for all. Uh, and, 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 and so we worship and we celebrate that day because that, that is a, that's what God wants for all of creation. And, and what does trampling look like? Mm -hmm. So to get, so the movement of that sermon can't, to get to the best Sabbath ever is to start with the trampled Sabbath, the failed Sabbath, the not knowing our Old Testament understanding, which is what the justice of God is rooted in, always has been rooted in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would say this is also a great week to spend maybe an hour working with whoever's going to read this text or making sure you find the right reader. Find a, if you have a poet in your congregation, I mean, somebody who can we can do something with this imagery, you know, the repair of the breach, but also that that line near the end, I will make you ride upon the heights of the earth. I mean, you need somebody who, it's not me, but somebody who can deliver that yeah. and pull out the poetry and the majesty of what's going on there and the depth of that promise. That's mm -hmm. worth an, a, an hour of sermon prep, I think, <laughs> should make sure that this is read really well and then to explore the poetry and the power of that. So. Mm -hmm. And then um, there's also Jeremiah, if you're doing reminds that. Of, so reminds me of one scene in uh, Fury Road where I myself will, what is it, right? Like, uh, you will ride through the gates of Valhalla. So <laughs> I myself will carry you through the gates of Valhalla. I myself will carry you. Yeah. So that's, yeah. Yeah. That's Great about movie. religious manipulation, though, I think. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. but still one of the but best still, movies. Good luck. Best. My, my point is the way it's, you know, the way oh, it's presented. It. It's yeah. like, oh, yeah, you know, by Emojin Joe, then, you know, it's. You need good. Joe to come and read this. Yeah, um, you need Emojin Joe to come and read the text. Best action film ever. Um, <sighs> so anyway, Jeremiah, I think this is the first of, of eight, eight Jeremiah's. But and then, then we nine, have a, if you count, yeah, there's a Lamentations. In there's there. a Lamentations interruption. Uh, Which is still Jeremiah-ish, because, you know, he can lament with the best of them. So yeah. this is a lot more time now in a particular prophet, and yeah. mm -hmm. mostly the, some of the more hopeful parts of Jeremiah, but we'll see some of the key imagery in the book, but here's the, here's the call of the prophet. Yeah, and I think, uh, I, well, one of the aspects of this particular text is the, the way in which that verse five has been heard by a lot of people. I mean, it's been, and, and the way in which it has become a kind of, um, it's become somewhat even ritualized uh, in, in sacramental practices or promises about, uh, particularly about death and resurrection. But uh, what does it mean to be, you know, known, um, known from the very beginning by God and being called by God? And uh, so that those that 
sense of promise is really going to resonate with a lot of people. And, um, and so that's certainly a direction you could go of what does that, what does that mean? What does that mean for the call of the prophet? What does it mean for Jeremiah? But how do you, how do you experience those, uh, those words from God for you? So maybe that'd be, it's an obvious direction, but maybe one, a preacher might want to take. And if you wanted to echo where uh, I uh, began in the Luke, uh, in the end, in terms of the actions of Jesus that are most grace filled, wind up also bringing the most shame or, or offering uh, the most judgment. Um, that's what the call is. The call is both and. You know, that you will pluck up and pull down, that you will destroy and overthrow, that you will build and plant. And um, it's not an either or, it's a both and. And if we think of that both and as truly being what grace looks like, um, on the negative side, it's what I call being an equal opportunity offender. You know, so don't don't just say the people like me are the folks that are going to get all the cheers and the people that aren't like me. I'm going to make sure that I condemn them. Well, I don't think that's gospel. The gospel is challenging to everyone. And sometimes it's challenging to me. And if it's not, it's probably not the gospel. And so uh, this is a place to realize that we're we're called to challenge all the things that are comfortable for us so that the comfort that is promised by God is made available to everyone. Yeah, as I, as I think about this text, I, I, this is interesting, we've got three, I think, really different approaches where somebody could go, which just is showing what preaching's like as, as yeah. well, right? But to, to think about the prophetic vocation mm -hmm. um, and to help people see that as the church's vocation, mm -hmm. as being a prophetic vocation, at least following, I think, how Luke and Acts talks about it that but as well the question of how do you know when you're following a, a true prophet like how does a prophet demonstrate their the validity of their message or their credentials is it just because they're an offender but no actually what's the like how do you recognize god speaking through somebody is a good question mm -hmm. to have people think about and maybe reflect in their own life like when do you know when you're hearing something that's trustworthy mm -hmm. or from a person who's trustworthy but then also, and this is, of course, because of where the three of us work, what we do for a living, um, that our calling is to teach people preparing for ministry, but to help people think about how, is, how does this, how do these calls happen today? Yeah. And how do communities mediate the call of God? And, and are there people in your community the community needs to be looking at? And how do you identify people with gifts, whatever those, those gifts are, and encourage them to, to go into service, whether that's ordained ministry or something else? But uh, yeah, just spend and, a little time on that because most mm -hmm. people think that's all happens at some level way over their heads, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. and of course it doesn't. It happens because individual people say you're really good at this or you have a heart for that. Mm -hmm. And the way in which the the call of the the call of the prophet is then uh, then the call of the people, right? It's a reminder of their call, mm -hmm. uh, and that's one of the one of the reasons for the prophets is to come alongside Israel and remind them that of their call from God. Uh, and so in terms of that discernment process, Matt, you know, who are those people who remind you of, of who you are called to be and uh, who God needs you to be. And so not only that initial calling, but the, the one who says, who are those ones who sustain your call, uh, sustain that your vocation and that vocation and call is not a uh, a, a set apartness, a world, uh, you know, a word for, or a vocation or a, a, a job for certain people, but we all are um, called and fundamentally called to be in relationship with God. That's what the, that's what the prophets will uh, do for Israel, right? That, that you're in relation, remind them of their relationship with God. And then what does that then, what does that call then require, ask of you, how will, they get, how will that call get embodied? And in that relationship, particularly to let people know that God is and that God has shown up and that where God has shown up has been good. And in, in saying that, I'm actually shifting to the psalm. Um, mm. uh, 
Matt, you asked, how do we know when a prophet is of God, when they're speaking? And I think we know when God is glorified, when God is blessed. Um, not my particular political stance, not my particular ideology, um, not um, the uh, not my favorite movie from this month. Uh, but at the end of the day, that whatever I am lifting up causes the person to say, um, "Bless the Lord, O oh my mm. soul," and not to forget what God has and is doing. And that's what this is This is saying, that God has lifted us up out of the worst and uh, that God has shown us love and mercy in a steadfast way. Um, and um, uh, that just answering that question that I asked before, um, what are we saying about God? Well, God is merciful. God is gracious slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. How do I know when a prophet is speaking uh, the truth of God is that they're telling me that God is, that God is good, and that that goodness looks like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great I, answer yeah, back. Yeah, I love that. If people have decided to do a late summer series on the book of Hebrews, you're probably at this week wondering why you decided to do that. Yes, I this week. Yeah. And this week. <laughs> I was going to say is, that this is a peculiar text in Hebrews. We're in the um, second. This is second to last. We've got. Yeah. Two and the commentary is really good at laying out some of the interpretations of this text that have been proposed. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. that's helpful. So we'll refer you to that if you've got yeah. questions about what in the world is up with these mountains. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> but I mean, there is I'll, I'll just I'll say that. And I, Caroline, I thought you wanted to get in no, go ahead. as well, but just the, the towards the end of the passage, verses 28 and 29, this idea of, of this move to worship, and maybe this connects to what you were saying, Joy, as well, about the psalm and the prophetic vocation and what it means to listen to a prophet. That the, what's the word I want here? Culmination, the crescendo, there's a musical word for you that I don't know, is about worship, that this is the the necessary response or the reasonable response. It reminds me of Romans 12, one through two, that in light of who God is, in light of what God has done, how can you not devote yourself to a life or a posture of worship and to then view life as extended worship or lived worship or embodied worship? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Caroline is going to say, oh, or, no, I no, we just, but, maybe, however, no, but, no just maybe what, no, one thing I was going to say is I, I think um, the, the hinge for this text here for me, it comes in, uh, in verse 22. I think the commentary talked about this a little bit, but the, that, that moment of realized eschatology, if you will, uh, that, but you have come, that's the, and, and it's, and the, the tense on that of you have come is um, uh, perfect and perfect tense. And so it's, you know, you, you're here. <laughs> um, the time is now for that, for that, and uh, embodying the Sabbath, living the Sabbath, praising God, uh, answering your call, living out your faith. Uh, and because, because all of the promises that we look forward to are actually here and now, and that's gets back to, you know, the urgency that we've been talking about, that the, that the promises of God are not a postponement right. that are, you know, that are going to um, be your gifts in heaven, but that, that you have come is you're here now. And then now what is that going to look like? So you sat as always through the entire podcast, if you're going to be preaching from the epistle, to hear all of our musing on all the texts to get to this one. And I want to circle it back around. And as much, Matt, as I loved your uh, best Sabbath ever, uh, I'm going to circle back around to um, what Caroline was lifting up for us when we were talking about Luke. And I'm going to hang on this line in verse uh, this phrase, literally in verse 27, yet once more, yet once more, 
Um, God is doing the same thing that God has always been doing. It is what is um, hinted at in the sacrifice of the Old Testament. It is what is made metaphor of in the Hebrew text talking about sacrifice and worship. And it is what we can expect of God even now, a shaking up of what is normal for us that shakes both the heavens and the earth to bring justice, to bring what is good consuming like a consuming fire to everyone, the justice of God.